Good morning. So when I was in graduate school, I was reading a lot of Henry James novels. And I became interested in the servants that appear very briefly in some of his novels. And I became particularly interested in them because it was so obvious that Henry James was not interested in them. <laughs> they clearly existed. Somebody was opening the doors and laying out the food and helping people get dressed, but they never became characters. They never existed as people. And I asked myself, who are these folks? Who are the poor in all of this prosperity? Now, I, I'm an English teacher. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an economist. It didn't seem enough to know who the poor were historically or statistically. I wanted to know where they were in our culture. Who were they in our literature? It turns out that there's no American version of Downton Abbey. So I had to look around for some sort of answer on my, for myself. And I became interested in how cultural ideas interact with political and economic ideas. And I want to discuss some of what I've been thinking about. I'm going to send to my talk around the year 1996. That was the year many of our seniors were born. So we have this one lifetime that's important to us to pivot around. But of course, another reason that I'm going to focus on 1996 was the passage of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, or welfare reform. That was a political and economic event that changed the community's relationship to poverty. It ended welfare as an entitlement and required parents to go to work in order to receive benefits. As part of the country's fascination with welfare during the mid-90s, the journalist Ken Oletta published an examination of the lives of people on welfare entitled The Underclass. And he began his book with the same question about the poor that I'd been asking. Who are these folks? One of the things that I've realized is that this is not just my question. The question itself is part of our culture. Americans regularly wonder, how can we be the richest country in the history of the world and still have 16 or 18 percent of our population living in poverty? And we often ask the question in just those kinds of abstract terms. And we talk about poverty being hidden in America. The journalist David Shipler has criticized this notion of hidden poverty. He points out that we can only talk about poverty being hidden because we don't want to think about the woman who served us coffee, or the guy who drove our cab, or the hotel maid that makes up our bed. The poor are part of the community, but our culture often treats them as if they're something separate. In fact, one curious thing I've learned in my reading is that we have a tradition of writers exploring poverty by pretending to be poor. So in 1897, a man named Walter Wyckoff left his studies at Princeton. He took a dollar with him and he traveled across country to prove that in America, any man willing to work hard could be a success. He dressed up like a common laborer. They weren't wearing blue jeans in Princeton in 1897. And he traveled the country to work as a ditch digger, a lumberjack, a farmhand. And after a year of that, he wrote a book in which he admitted that he finally understood what hard work was. And he returned to Princeton and became their first sociology professor. The writer Stephen Crane also changed his clothes to pretend to be poor. And he was so dedicated to his pretend poverty that some of his friends were embarrassed to be seen with him. He wanted to find out what made the poor different. But after months on bread lines and living in shelters, he admitted he couldn't find any differences. During the 1930s, a Hollywood reporter borrowed a poor woman's costume from the MGM wardrobe department and took to traveling around the country pretending to be homeless so she could write about it. Some of you know the film Sullivan's Travels, which makes fun of a similar sort of adventure. And coming back to 1996, after welfare reform was passed, a, a journalist named Barbara Ehrenreich spent a year living as a waitress, a cleaning woman, a hotel maid, working minimum wage jobs to try to understand what life would be like for those people. She concluded that it's impossible to live decently on minimum wage. That fact should not surprise us. First of all, Walter Wyckoff had come to the same conclusion 100 years earlier. But more to the point, we all know what it costs to buy food 
and housing and health care. We know it costs more than $7.25 an hour. What should surprise us is that the book Nickel and Dimed had to be written at all. Why do we need to periodically restate the obvious by asking this question? Why do we need to think of the poor as somehow separate, distant from the rest of the community? I think it's because the factual existence of poverty clashes with the mythology of America as a place where prosperity is inevitable. The literary critic Roland Barth has a helpful way to think about this. According to Barth, we use mythology to transform history into nature, to help us believe that specific events are part of the natural order. They show the way the world just works. It is what it is. We've turned the historical occurrence of prosperity into part of the natural order. When we say America is a land of prosperity, we like to believe that's not something that has happened in America. It's what America is. But then we come back to that question. If prosperity is part of the natural order for Americans, why are so many of us poor? What I call that 1996 question, who are these folks? Let's look at how two novels have addressed this question. I'm choosing two novels that were bestsellers and were also made into award-winning movies. One was before 1996, and one was after 1996. The first novel is an easy choice. When you talk about poverty in American history, you have to talk about the Great Depression. And if you want to talk about the Depression, you end up talking about John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. The Grapes of Wrath is practically synonymous with the Great Depression. It gives us our essential image of the Dust Bowl, of migrant laborers, of the economic collapse of the American dream. And this is not an accident. Steinbeck studied the lives of the poor, he traveled up and down California living with migrant workers, but he didn't want to just copy what he saw. He was interested in creating an image of poverty that fit in with the thinking of his time. He set out to bring these kinds of images into his novel. So The Grapes of Wrath tells the story of a hardworking, honest family, the Joads. They're uprooted from their home in Oklahoma, and they're forced to travel to California. They expect to find opportunities for farming, but they're forced to become migrant laborers. They search desperately for work, and they're shunned and abused almost everywhere they go. Family members die, traveling companions are murdered, they lose all of their possessions. But they never lose faith that work will make them prosperous. And they never lose faith in their fellow Americans. No matter where they go or how they are treated, they're unfailingly kind, looking to work together and build community. That faith in prosperity makes the Joads more wholly American. In his first inaugural address, Franklin Delano Roosevelt called on Americans to remember our interdependence on each other. And he described that interdependence as the true spirit of the American pioneer. At the end of the 1939 movie, Ma Joad sums up their identity in language that is very close to that phrase from the uh, preamble of the Constitution. She says, we're the people that live. They can't wipe us out. They can't lick us. We'll go on forever, Pa, because we're the people. In 1939, the poor are the ultimate Americans. They're the very center of the community. And that was a cultural view that was synonymous with the politics and economics of its time. The New Deal also put the poor at the center of the community. In a sense, both Roosevelt and Steinbeck are answering that 1996 question with the words of Ma Jode, we are the people. Before I go on to my second novel, I need to look at that question, and I need to go back to Ken Oletta's version of that question, because I have not given his full quote. Here is the question that has actually appeared in his book. Who are those folks lurking behind bulging crime, welfare, drugs, and all too visible rise in antisocial behavior that frighten citizens leaving them convinced they are being chased. What happened to Ma Jod? Where's we're the people? Why are the poor now a terrifying, antisocial, immoral force? Part of the change grows out of our changing our minds about FDR's link between interdependence and that true American spirit. And I'm going to pick out one small example of how that sort of thing happened. Many of us remember Ronald Reagan telling the story of the welfare queen. 
The story was originally a historical fact. A Chicago woman named Linda Taylor did steal $8,000 in welfare payments from the state of Illinois. Ronald Reagan used her story to link welfare to crime. But he wasn't explaining history. He was creating myth. He used the fact that Linda Taylor actually existed to claim that government action caused poverty and caused immorality. He wanted to make that idea appear to be a kind of indisputable truth. It's part of the natural order. It is what it is. Uh, I want to see how that idea interacts with literature in, our, in the second novel I want to examine. The poet Sapphire published Push in 1996. It was also made into an award-winning movie entitled Precious a few years ago. And it gives us a very different view of the poor and their place within the community. In Push, the main character, Precious, is an honest, hard-working young woman who is attempting to pull herself out of poverty by her very thin bootstraps. We follow her rising ambition and sense of self-respect, but we also see that her virtues may not be representative of all of the poor. For example, Precious's mother is emotionally, physically, and sexually abusive. Precious's father has abandoned Precious after getting her pregnant for the second time and giving her HIV. It's as if Precious is a Steinbeck character, but her family comes lurking out of Oleta's underclass. Criminal, antisocial, frightening. Sapphire's ambivalence about the morality of the poor is echoed by her ambivalence about their place within the community. The plot involves Precious's moving away from her mother and into a shelter with an alternative school and a healthcare center. She begins to think about education and plan for her future. And then we learn that Precious will be forced to go to work as a home health aide. That problem of being forced to go to work is taken directly from the 1996 welfare law. Workfare puts into practice the idea that government assistance actually hurts the poor. It robs them of their opportunity for work and their initiative. The welfare system in push is an oppressive force designed to keep Precious in her place as a menial laborer. On the other hand, we see that all of the people who have a positive impact on Precious's life work for the government. It's social workers, teachers, and shelter aides who save Precious's life and offer Precious the only sense of community she's ever had, the only relationships that are remotely like family. So Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath and Sapphire's Push both attempt to resolve that tension between the mythology of prosperity and the fact of poverty by reimagining the poor and their place in the community. In 1939, Steinbeck imagines a poor family at the center of the American experience. In 1996, Sapphire acknowledges that the poor characters exist outside of the margins, but not quite off the page. Steinbeck's novel comes out a decade after the Dust Bowl and the stock market crash. Sapphire publishes Push 16 years after Ronald Reagan condemned government action. <clears throat> Literature may be a mirror on society, but it seems to be slow to come into focus. What's been happening since 1996? Since welfare reform passed, there's been a steady stream of memoirs by people who grew up in poverty and made it to the middle class. Right? Jeanette Walls' The Glass Castle is perhaps the most famous. They tell stories of success against the odds. The authors paint themselves as resourceful and hardworking, like the Jodes, like Precious Jones. However, like Precious, the poor these individuals grow up around, their families and neighbors, are usually lazy, immoral, frightening. In this vision, the solution to poverty is not a community concern because most of the poor don't deserve to be part of the community. Some individuals may be welcomed in. This portrait of poverty as an individual condition may need to be rethought. Recently, as in 1929, the stock market and the housing market have worked to make poverty more than an individual condition. As the country attempts to deal with the aftershocks of the Great Recession, writers are going to need to begin to work its changes into their portrait of America. That portrait may not come into focus for a few years. So as we turn to our theme here, the care of the future is mine, I want to say that some part of how we care for the future 
depends on how we imagine the present, how we work out the tension and wrinkles in our worldview, how we deal with the conflict between our mythology and our facts, how we answer that question about the poor, who are these folks? Thank you.